Well, you're probably wondering how this Chimera resin conversion turned from gray to green since the last episode. Well, there's a really simple explanation behind that. <laughs> Hey, I'm John. Thanks for joining me for this video. Now, in the last video, I had used these resin uh, conversion pieces from Blood and Skull Industries, which there's going to be a link down below to uh, their website, to convert the tracked chimera to a wheeled chimera. And uh, the, the last photo you saw in the video was it rubber band together. And then after everything dried, I primed it for the YouTube thumbnail, uh, so it would just be a nice gray color. Well, after that, my plan had been to uh, stipple on some Mr. Surfacer 500 to create a textured surface, which would kind of blend the texture that was left on the resin with the flat plastic of the model, so it would all look as one piece. So I textured the model and talked about why I was doing it and said something to the effect of, okay, now I'm going to go put down the base coat of green. Well, after I put down the base coat of green, I came back, and guess what I had forgotten to do? I forgot to hit record. So I sat in front of uh, the the camera with it turned without the record button and talked away. So anyway, that's kind of a catch up on where the model is now. The next step is going to be to apply some color modulation to the model. I started off with a coat of to me is XF81 Dark Green 2 RAF, uh, and I darkened it down just a little bit with some blue, just so that it would be uh, a little bit of a shadow color. Now the next layer I'm going to put on is going to be some more Tamiya XF81, this time without anything to darken it down, and that's going to be just kind of a general color around the top of the model. Alright, I have the XF81 applied, and what I did was I concentrated it on these areas basically everywhere but down here uh, these areas that were that are going to be more in shadow i left them with the darker color of xf81 for the turret i did the same thing everything received a coat of xf81 i applied it from above so like the bottom of the barrel is still the darker color but the top is the xf81 um, i didn't spray up under the turret ring I left the underside the darker color on the wheels. I sprayed in around this rim here and that that circular part right there in the middle. The bolt area is left in the darker color. Again, just to provide a little more volume. And then I'll go in, of course, and lighten up a lot more of this. But that's that's what the modulation does, is it just it just builds up highlights. Uh, so that these details stand out a little more and just make them appear to have a little more volume than they do uh, considering that it's just a very small object. All right, the next step will be to add a little bit of yellow to the XF81 and hit it with another coat that will lighten up some more areas. All right, well, I've got the final highlighting done. Uh, what I did was I took the base color that I've been working with, Tamiya XF81 Dark Green 2 RAF, and I begin adding more and more of this yellow green into it. Uh, the reason I chose yellow green and not white or yellow, the reason I didn't choose white is it would have desaturated this color. It would have moved it more towards gray than I wanted. I wanted to retain a very green look. If I would have used pure yellow, it would have made this a very bright green, um, uh, more so than I, than I really wanted. By using this yellow green, it's got some yellow in it, obviously, and it's got some green in it. So it kind of kept me uh, in the middle. Now I could have used yellow and just used a few drops of it, uh, but this allowed me to uh, just a, a greater uh, comfort zone, I guess you would say, in terms of, of lightening the color up. But what I did was I, I lightened it up with a little bit of the yellow green and I began painting along the lower edges of these angles uh, because what this is doing is it's separating the volumes, it's separating the sections. It's not necessarily trying to put fake light effects 
as if light were coming from this one direction, but rather to separate the volumes, uh, uh, keep the, the, the sections distinct so that later weathering won't cover that up. It won't seem so flat. So you can see I started off with my, my initial light color and I got everything that was facing up all the way around. And then I got on these angles, I got the lower edge up to about halfway all the way around. Now the paint was heavily thinned so it, it went on in a very light layer and I was able to build it up. And then I added more of the yellow green and I hit these areas that were even higher up, the tops of hatches, uh, handles, the tops of these, around on these. I sprayed a little more of a gradient about a quarter of the way up on these. And that at some point you just start eyeballing it and saying, okay, is this achieving what I want? Um, you know, there's, there's no, there's probably a wrong answer there's probably a more correct answer, but I think as long as we're somewhere in between the two, maybe leaning more towards, uh, okay, I can see that this visually makes sense, I think we're okay. And certainly, if when you're, when you're doing this, if you find that you get any one of the layers a little too stark, all you would need to do is go back with the previous color, thin down, and just tone it down a bit. So I could have taken like when I, when I did this initial uh, lightning layer that went up about halfway, if I thought it was too much, I could have just thinned down some of the XF81 straight out of the bottle, thinned it way down and misted it on to bring it back to how I wanted. But I'm pretty happy with how it looks. Uh, right now it looks a little comical. If I just called it done right here, um, it would look a little silly. But like I said, later weathering is gonna take advantage of all of this coloring and shading. Now on the tires, I initially gave it the very darkest coat all the way on there. And then I just kind of misted some XF81 over it, over the whole thing, and a very thin coat. And then with the, the first lightning color, I hit the middle of the rim right there. And then with the second lightning color, I hit it here, all the way around here. Now. It's true that this is a surface that's going to be like this, facing vertically, and the light is going to, you know, it's going to be falling from above, but I don't know how I'm going to position the wheel on there. So I can do later oil effects if I want to try and simulate that to get the direction of the light a little sharper. But this just kind of helps the volume stand out because, again, this is less about um, simulating light effect and more about bringing out the volumes, bringing out the shapes. So by doing these in different colors, it's going to help those stand out a little bit. And when I begin adding the weathering, uh, hopefully it'll begin to, uh, to uh, get them to stand out a little bit. Now, as if I hadn't rambled on about this a little more, if you've never tried this, what I would recommend is go for more subtle color transitions than sharp color transitions because that's a lot easier to control, um, and and it 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 avoids the 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 possibility of going overboard in terms of very sharp color contrast. I've seen people do it. I've seen people take uh, the 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 highlighting and the shading much further than this. Often bringing the most, the topmost highlights almost to, in this case, you know, almost to a pure dull yellow. Uh, and if, if you're comfortable with that, if you like the way that looks, do it. But if you've never tried it before, I would recommend starting with very thin paint and very subtle color changes and just kind of experiment around. One of the great things to do is just keep a piece of sheet plastic uh, next to your airbrush station and when you put on that, that dark base color before you put it on the model, put it on the sheet plastic. Make sure the sheet plastic is the same base color as the model, so in this case, primer gray. But put it on the sheet plastic, and then when you have your next color, put that down next to it. And so it kind of lets you test what is the color transition between this color and this color and this color and this color, and lets you see it uh, before you start putting it on the model, and lets you fine-tune uh, your mix in the color cup. But 
like I said, uh, start subtle and then build up. And once you get comfortable with it, then you can decide how sharp you want the color transitions on the model. Well, it's been a while since I've put a gloss coat on a model at this stage, but I think I'm going to do it uh, because I, I think it will work well with the way that I want to do the finishes that will come after this. So the next step is to get this guy gloss coated and I'll move on to the decals. Okay, I have the model gloss coated. Uh, I used Pledge or Future or Clear or whatever it's called where you live, but it, really what's important is it's a gloss coat. Um, doesn't matter which gloss coat you use. Now if you've watched some of my previous videos, you know that I've, I've shown putting on decals without a gloss coat. Um, on this one I chose to do a gloss coat because I wanted uh, when I did uh, the pen washes and things like that, I wanted to start with a little cleaner look. The model's not going to be clean, but I want those initially to be a little tighter. So it's easier to do that with a gloss coat. And I'll then develop things later, but that's why I'm starting with a gloss coat this time. It's not specifically for the decals or decals or decals or whatever you want to call them. Um, but rather it's for the other effects that I'm going to put on. I want to take advantage of that. All right, the tools that I'll be using, uh, I've got a blade here to cut out the decals. I have a micro set, which is to put on the surface of the model before the decal. That'll help it settle in. I have solve a set, which is to be put on the decal afterwards, which will uh, soften it up and help it conform better. I've got my tweezers to help me maneuver things around. I've got this uh, cotton bud that will allow me to squeegee out water from under the decal. And then I've just got this other piece of paper towel to help me dab stuff off and this to just touch the decals onto when I'm ready to get them out of the water. My water is off camera. It's in a coffee cup. It's coffee warm. It's I have my coffee cup sitting on a coffee cup warmer so that it maintains a, a good temperature. But it, it I, I like using warmer, almost hot water. And again, as I've described before, uh, the temperature is basically coffee hot. However hot you like drinking your coffee, that's how hot the water can be. Um, it's not boiling. It's not lukewarm. It's fairly hot, but drinkable hot. And then, of course, I have my decals. All right, and I want to take this decal and put it right there. So I've got it in my tweezers and I'm holding it in my warm water, hot water off camera. And I'm going to just show you by um, continuing to babble on how long I'm holding it in the water. And that should be enough. I'm going to touch it off here on this paper towel. And yeah, it's good and loose now. So I'm just going to set it here for just a second. First, I'm going to go into my micro set, which is a surface preparation to help the decal adhere. Even though I put future on this, I'm going to use this surface prep because it's a very rough textured surface. So I want to make sure, why are you getting stuck now? There we go. I want to make sure that I've got a good opportunity for it to snuggle down there. Now I'm going to live dangerously and I'm going to position it with a hobby blade, otherwise known as an X-Acto knife. You might want to use a, a brush or some other tool if you don't feel comfortable using a blade, but just something to move it around and position it. Now I'm going to take my cotton bud and roll over it like that to get rid of any bubbles that are under it. And if it gets stuck and you can't move it around while you're trying to position it, just take a, another clean brush and add some warm water around it and then that should float it back up. Now using a separate brush, because I don't want to get my micro set and my solva set mixed up, I'm going to put on some of this solva set. I use Solva Set rather than Microsol. Microsol is the twin product for Micro Set that you put on afterwards. I think Solva Set is just a little hotter. Um, I think it works a little better. It makes the decals conform a little better. 
but I just paint that on and because I've gloss coated the surface I'm not worried about this stuff touching the paint it's generally if you don't flood it it's generally pretty friendly to paint and other uh, things like that once I get it fully covered I leave it alone because in a few seconds it's going to start softening that decal and if I go in and try and if I even just try and start painting some more on there to point like this there's a very good chance that decal will smear I mean literally like ink across the the uh, surface so once you get the initial coat on there leave it alone don't touch it again if you see bubbles forming while um, it's drying that's normal let them form leave it alone they'll go away after a while if there are any left you can address those afterwards place I'm most likely to see any silvering is on decals like this that have the clear film in an open area like here the film the the number nine is of course white but there's some of the clear film in those open areas because of the textured surface even with the the steps that I took to try and eliminate silvering there may be some little bubbles because of the texturing there's a couple of ways maybe more than that to deal with it one once this dries I can if there's any apparent bubbles I can uh, that might cause silvering I can slice into them with my knife and put another drop of Solvacet in there that may take care of them another method to use is simply use the whatever your base paint is and just touch in a spot of paint where the silvering is that'll cover it up and then a third option which is kind of like the second one is to just simply uh, paint in a chip or some rust or some kind of weathering effect to cover up the silvering but between those three methods if there's any silvering I'll be able to take care of it with no problem there's a few details I need to paint around the model I'm gonna paint this skull and wings here with some Ushabti bone and I'll of course apply this in two thin coats I'll highlight this appropriately with some screaming skull and all I'm going to do here is just get the most upturned surfaces like the top of the skull and then I'm going to do but just the outer third of the wings there on either side I'm going to dry brush the main machine gun with lead belcher I previously undercoated it with Vallejo black gray by dry brushing it like this it gives it a dark steely look I'll come back in later and add some some shades and do some more dry brushing to bring up the highlights but this gives a good foundation for most guns you can see how that dry brushing leaves a very steely gritty looking texture to it I like putting lead belcher over black it looks so cool next I'm going to give the gun a good coat of known oil with the known oil dry, I'm going to dry brush some Rune Fang steel over the whole gun very lightly just to bring out the details and the edges. I'm going to base coat the gun handles in Vallejo deck tan. Using just the very tip of my brush, I'm going to lightly trace in some lines to simulate wood grain. The final touch, I'm going to paint those little triggers red. All right, here's the final look for the gun. Um, those wooden handles either look like wood or maybe a little bit like burned bacon, but I like bacon too. <laughs> for the gun that goes on the front of the hull, I had already painted the gun part black and dry brushed it with the lead belcher. So now I'm going to go over the leather part, what I want to be look, looking like leather with uh, a base coat first of Rhinox Hide. That's a Citadel paint. All right, the next step on the gun cover is to do a very light dry brush of some Tuscor fur over this. Being very careful not to get to the lead belcher bits that I've already painted. Finally, I'll go over that with a wash of 50-50 Agrax Earth Shade and Reichland Flesh Shade. That'll give it kind of a brownie red look to it. 
And I'll just soak up any excess like that because I just want to deepen the shadows just a little bit and give it an overall tint. And there you can see how that looks. Now you may ask, why would you make that leather? I just made it leather because I think it looks cool, basically. Could have done this in olive drab or uh, just about any color you want, you know, to imagine any material you want. But I just thought, hey, let's put some leather on this thing just because I like doing those textures. All right, well, I think I'm going to call this end video. Uh, I've got it painted, gloss coated, decaled. Got the details painted in. Right now, everything's just dry fitted on there. Nothing's just, nothing that and that and the wheels they are not glued on. Um, so that I can continue working with them in the next episodes. But um, I'm happy where it's at. Uh, I think this is this is a good simple way to uh, give your your model an interesting look and get it prepared for weathering and all the later steps. So that's going to be coming in the next few videos. Well, thank you so much for watching this video, and especially if you're uh, here hanging around at the end. I always appreciate uh, the folks that uh, watch all the way through to the end, and I like to. Uh, have some fun every now and then. So if you're still watching at this point, uh, just drop a comment below that says, I like bacon. Just just put that in there. Even if you don't like bacon, just put, I like bacon. Um, and, uh, and we'll know what you're talking about. Uh, those folks who don't watch the whole video, they may not know, but we'll have fun with it. We'll know what you're talking about. If you've not already done so, there's a subscribe link down over here. So I would be very, very grateful if you would click that and hit the little bell icon so that you'll know when I have new videos out. I'd also be grateful if just uh, as you're watching my videos, if you if you would be kind enough to just drop a comment. Just let me know that you watched it, you know, what you thought of it. It really does help me. I'm, I'm trying to grow the channel and anytime I get likes and shares and um, comments and things like that. It, it just helps me in that endeavor. So I would be most grateful for your help in that way. There's also links down below to the social media that I'm on. So if you're on one of those platforms, please do connect with me there. I always like hearing from, uh, from folks who watch my videos. There is also a link to Patreon. If you would like to support the work that I do, uh, help me in this endeavor, then I would be most grateful if you would check that out. And if you're already a Patreon supporter, thank you so much for uh, standing by me in this, uh, this hobby. It really does make a huge difference for me and my family. Uh, it's not just about me uh, getting some money because I want to play with toys. I really couldn't afford to do this otherwise uh, at the pace that I do it with the materials and things. If it weren't for your support, we just couldn't afford it. So uh, thank you for for supporting me uh, each month. And I, I know that it's a sacrifice uh, to just give some dude some money to play with toys. Um, but I am most grateful and it is very much appreciated. So thank you. And with all that being said, I'll leave you with one final thought as I always like to do. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you friends. Bye-bye.